Do we have enough toilet paper? Apparently that's one of the main questions Americans have been asking themselves, as grocery store shelves are emptied of anything related to sanitation. Toilet paper, Lysol, Clorox, hand soap, and hand sanitizer. In my own area, I've also seen runs on rice, bottled water, guns, ammunitions, and even the Sawyer brand water filters that are made for hiking deep into the wilderness. All of this as the world reacts to the outbreak of the Wuhan virus, or COVID-19 if you prefer. Are people overreacting? Is the mainstream media overselling it? Or is it really as bad as advertised? All valid questions as we brace for the potential spread of this new, highly infectious viral disease. But this episode won't be much about prepping, or current politics versus reality in regards to the spread of the coronavirus. We're going to take a look at the last truly mega pandemic that swept the world in 1918, the Spanish flu. You might be thinking that we'll start in Spain. After all, it is called the Spanish flu. But you might be surprised. 1918 saw the world in the midst of World War I. On one side were France, Britain, and Russia, the U.S. and Italy. And on the other side was Germany, Austria, the Ottoman Empire, and Bulgaria. The war had been raging since July of 1914 and left much of Europe in shambles and stressed supply chains to the max. We all laugh about hoarding and prepping, but imagine being caught in the middle of a war between superpowered alliances. The United States didn't officially enter the war until August 6, 1917, when it declared war on Germany. In all, some 4 million military personnel would be called up to serve. It was in March of the following year, at Fort Riley Military Base, located just outside the small town of Manhattan, Kansas, which is the home of the Kansas State Wildcats. A U.S. Army private and cook named Albert Gitchell began to cough. Gitchell got sicker and sicker and was isolated in the infirmary, but soon after, his vicious and mysterious cold began to spread, and within a week, over a thousand soldiers at Fort Riley had become terribly ill, and almost 50 of them died. But media coverage of the event was minimal at best, and outright ignored in political news, as one of the most progressive presidents in American history, Woodrow Wilson, sought to spread his vision of American power. It didn't take long for the new disease to spread to other military bases, as the United States, not quite the superpower it was today, geared up for the First World War, seeking to establish itself among the elite nations. Very soon after Gitchell came down with what may be the first known case, the disease reached boats departing for Europe on the American East Coast. Having now spread through much of America, it wasn't long before the newly arriving Americans started spreading it to their European counterparts in France and Britain. But it was in Spain, a neutral country that had avoided the war, that news reports of the savage illness began to widely circulate and get noticed. And thus, the Spanish flu was born. Extreme fatigue, fever, and a severe cough and headache were among the most intense symptoms of the flu. And further complications, like pneumonia, were not uncommon. The pneumonia could be so severe that it could cause cyanosis, and turn you so blue that no one could be sure about your skin color. The Spanish flu, unlike the current Wuhan virus, seemed to favor younger people. And for many, it proved to be lethal in as little as a few days after the first time you realized you were sick. The flu wreaked havoc in war-torn Europe, where entire regions, already weary from fighting, struggled to respond to the sheer number of sick. Keep in mind that in 1918, there was no vaccine for anything, and the only remedies were rest, avoiding contact, and trying to practice good hygiene. Areas that were lucky enough to avoid armed conflict still had to struggle with the outbreak of the Spanish flu. Doing things we might recognize today, such as closing schools, banning large gatherings, was about all people could do. No place was prepared for the disease, and in many cases, there were so many dead 
that the only way to deal with them was through mass graves. The fighting of World War I ended in the late fall of 1918, but it wasn't all sunshine. This new mingling of people, celebrating the end of the First World War, just served to further spread the Spanish flu, and many more people who had survived the war would be claimed by the illness. In all, in just a year's time, the Spanish flu claimed the lives of millions upon millions of people. The exact number is unknown, but even the most conservative estimates put the number at a shocking 20 million, which is nearly double the amount of active duty military casualties amongst all combatant nations. Some estimates of the amount of people killed by the Spanish flu worldwide reach as high as 50 to 100 million. But then the Spanish flu just up and disappeared sometime between 1919 and 1920. And to this day, no one is really sure why. Spanish flu was then rediscovered in the 1990s in the frozen lung tissue of an Inuit woman buried in the permafrosts of Alaska. And in 2005, its genetic sequence was published. And one of the leading theories is that it might have been a form of avian flu that may have transferred from birds to humans. But why did it target young people so much more? Again, no one really has an answer. One theory is that Spanish flu was more extreme in younger people because of the way it interacted with their stronger immune systems, triggering something within your body called a cytokine storm, in which your body's own cells start becoming more and more inflamed in response to the infection. Several other theories on the origin of Spanish flu are well documented, including a disease outbreak that occurred in France in 1917, and even some evidence to suggest that it originated in China, related to a disease outbreak in 1916 or 1917. But without a time machine, no one can really be sure. To this day, there is no vaccine for the Spanish flu. And if it were to return, it would certainly challenge us once again. And if an outbreak did occur, it's still estimated that some 300,000 Americans might be killed before it could be stopped. So pandemics aren't new. The current Wuhan virus is just the latest in a long line that stretches back as far as life on Earth. History tells us that we will most likely never be prepared. And really, how could you prepare? The amount of preparation necessary would be a dramatic and ongoing economic burden that most countries couldn't sustain. And it would be hard to justify in the potentially century-long stretches that don't see massive outbreaks. The best preparation remains the actions that you can take on your own. Cover your face when you sneeze or cough. Avoid contact with other people as much as possible, especially if you're sick or you think they're sick. Eat healthy, drink water, and get plenty of rest and try to have all of your affairs in order enough so that you can avoid the panic mobs. And I'd always be wary of anyone clamoring to get you to give up your freedom in exchange for the snake oil of state security. Be sure to check out the episode description for a link to loreandlegends.net where I'll list all the sources I used in this episode and some further things you might like to read. That's all for this episode. See you next time. The music in this episode, The Complex, by Kevin McLeod, available at filmmusic.io, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0. Visit creativecommons.org 